As you know, academic freedom has been a fundamental organizing principle of universities for nearly 200 years now, going back to the founding of the University of Berlin by Wilhelm von Humboldt and drawing on ideas about the crucial role of freedom of research and teaching articulated, I can't help but resist, by German philosophers such as Fichte, Schleiermacher, and Schelling. Though the centrality of academic freedom has long been established in American universities, as can be seen not just in the famous 1940 Statement of Principles by AEUP and what was then the Association of American Colleges, but whose predecessors go back even further to the very founding of AAUP in 1915, academic freedom has nonetheless never been without challenges and threats. In fact, as I think we'll hear from our speaker, uh, it was, it, the, the statement of principles was enunciated initially in response to um, challenges and threats, uh, some of which continue until today. Today, the fact that uh, academic freedom is not without challenges and threats is most assuredly the case. I would submit, though I'm not giving the talk today, that the challenges today are more multifarious than they've been in the past. There are, of course, challenges from official political forces that would prefer to impose orthodoxy rather than to tolerate and even encourage heterogeneous pursuit of inquiry characteristic of, of the university. But there are challenges as well from other sources, including today's students who often voice concerns that offensive language or ideas create a hostile learning space, and challenges created by the availability to almost literally everyone of tools of mass communication such as Twitter and the intensification of controversies that such communications can produce. Given these challenges and their importance, it is my honor and my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Risa Leibowitz. Professor Leibowitz is Professor of Labor and Employment Law in the Cornell University School of Industrial and Labor Relations, where she's been a professor since 1982. She's also currently serving as General Counsel of the American Association of University Professors, or AAUP, as those in the business know it, uh, who's on who, and, on, and on whose Committee A on Academic Freedom and Tenure she has also served. Professor Leibowitz's publications include articles on academic freedom in the university, as well as articles on labor law and on constitutional issues of freedom of speech in the employment setting. Her current research focuses on the corporatization of the university and the implications these developments on, of these developments on academic freedom and the role of higher education in a democratic society. Please join me in welcoming Professor Risa Leibowitz. Thank you so much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, and thanks you all for thank you all for coming. Um, I, I'd like to thank the provost and the provost office for uh, supporting this. I really appreciate it, and a special thank you to Professor Marcus Arvin, who has done the heavy lifting of a lot of the planning here and, and welcomed me very warmly. <clears throat> As you may know, I had to um, we had to reschedule because um, originally I lost my voice. I don't know about six weeks ago, and it hasn't. It's deciding whether to fully come back. And so I'm about 90% there, and I decided nothing is going to uh, silence me, uh, either physically or in other ways. So I'm, I'm really happy that we could reschedule, and it, it's a great pleasure to be here. So I'm going to certainly make some remarks and uh, provide some analysis that I hope that you find interesting about academic freedom, but I also look forward to having the chance for an interchange. I mean, the structure here is very much you know, in this setting of me up here uh, delivering the truth uh, to all of you. And I think I have some things to say which I believe are true, but in the, um, the tradition of the university, it's all about discussion and debate as much as it is uh, hearing uh, the, quote, truth from, 
from whoever is up here. At any rate, so let me just dive in and, and, um, and discuss various aspects. First, let me tell you that, as, as you just heard, the issues that I'll address today come from my work as an academic in terms of my research and my teaching, and it also comes from my work as a general counsel for the AAUP, and I'm in my fourth year doing that work as general counsel. Uh, and it's really been fascinating to do both, to continue, of course, teaching and research and doing my own work on campus and faculty governance, as well as working with the national AAUP on the various issues that come up. And uh, we file amicus curiae briefs and do other kinds of work uh, to address these issues. And all of these areas, there's, there are thematic issues that run through my work. As you just heard, some of the things that I work on with regard to academic freedom focus on what's called, been called the, quote, corporatization of the university and the institutional trends within university where a, a corporate model has become more and more prevalent as opposed to a more traditional academic model. And in looking at these institutional trends, we also find ourselves in a current political climate that has exacerbated problems of corporatization and restrictions on academic freedom, both on campus and off campus. And in my work, I look very much at the impact of these institutional and political trends on academic freedom of faculty and the impact on the public mission of the university. Now, just as a definitional piece here, when I say university, I'm just using it as shorthand for all colleges and universities, including two-year institutions as well as four-year institutions. And when I say faculty, I normally will mean all faculty, that is people who are tenure track, tenured, as well as those who are not on the tenure track, but faculty within a university. And as I go on, I will be distinguishing among these various categories of faculty in terms of the impact on academic freedom. The other thing that I work on in terms of corporatization and various institutional trends has to do with looking at the way that the concept of academic freedom is intertwined with the shared governance model. That is the model, which is traditional in universities, of governance being shared among different actors, different parties in the university. And so shared governance, including faculty governance, not simply administrative governance. And with the changes in the organizational structures and the labor structures of universities um, and other political trends dealing with things like privatization, we've seen a, an enormous impact of those trends on not only academic freedom, but also on shared governance. So these are all the issues that I work on, but I will be, and, and I will be bringing all of those into my talk today. And so the overarching idea here, as I'll discuss further in a moment, is the way in which academic freedom, due process, and shared governance are principles and practices that express the values at the heart of the university, that they're central to the identity of the university and to the identity of the faculty. They're central to what it means to be a university and what it means to be a faculty member in a university. That's still true, but with all the trends that I referred to, holding on to that central identity and those central practices and principles are becoming more and more uh, challenging uh, issues. So let me go back to what you've already heard about 1915 and just do a little bit of background on the development of academic freedom. And I'm doing this not simply because it's interesting, it is interesting, but I'm also doing it because I think that looking at the background of academic freedom in the United States and shared governance in the US and universities is, it resonates with the kinds of trends that we're seeing today. So moving back to the AUP's founding, the AUP was founded in 1915, just celebrated our 100th anniversary just a little while ago. But it was founded in 1915 in response to the actions of universities during the industrialization period in the late 1800s and into the early 1900s. Um, at that time, 
it became more and more apparent that individual faculty were vulnerable to the unilateral power of university administrations who hired them and who fired them. And that vulnerability came about at that period of industrialization because during this period with capitalist industrialization, with the power being concentrated, power and wealth in industrialists, there was a shift from industrialists and business people donating thousands of dollars to universities to donating millions of dollars to universities. And with that increase in donations to, into the millions of donation um, dollars to university came the expectation from those industrialists that the faculty would not bite the hand that was feeding them. Well, fortunately, faculty have always been very good at biting the hands that feed them, and that was true at that time as well. But without the protections of academic freedom and without the protections of tenure and governance, what occurred at that time were some very well-known cases of discharges of faculty members um, who at that time were economists. They were the kinds of economists that we need who were um, engaging in social critique and who were calling for social reform that included things like the need for public utilities and um, the need to have regulation of issues of labor like child labor. And so, so two famous cases were E.I. Ross from Stanford, who was fired from Stanford, and Edward Bemis fired from University of Chicago. Um, and the insistence from the industrialists was that faculty should comply more with the wishes of the industrialists who were funding the universities and administrators were complying with those kinds of demands from industry. So faculty responded in the way that labor responds when they are being treated in a way that affects their working conditions in a way that was very negative and they organized. So uh, when I started studying academic freedom, I started studying it as a labor lawyer, as somebody who was studying labor and employment law. And I became very interested in academic freedom, as many of us do, because of some personal experiences that I had. So I said, well, I have to read more about this. So when I read about 1915 and the founding of the AAUP, I said, well, of course that's what people do. That's what people do who are working people. They organize when the power of the employer becomes oppressive. And that's what faculty did. Now, they didn't organize into what we would traditionally think of as a union, but they organized into the American Association of University Professors, the AAUP, and they organized for the same reasons that people do form unions. That is, to resist the coercive power at that time of university administrators and the coercive power of corporate donors. So the AUP had a founding document that's called the 1915 Declaration of Principles on Academic Freedom and Academic Tenure, which was a statement that still expresses the collective principles of the academic profession. The 1915 Declaration also made collective demands for university administrators to respect individual rights of academic freedom and collective rights of faculty governance. Now, from those founding principles and the subsequent 1940 Statement of Principles on Academic Freedom and Tenure come the collective and individual rights that we still find central to the academic profession. These are well known to people, but I'll just tick them off here very uh, briefly. There are individual rights that faculty have to engage in academic freedom in their teaching, in their research, and in their extramural speech. Now, the term extramural speech is one that isn't as obvious in its meaning as teaching and research, but I think in this university and others, it's becoming more familiar given the issues that have occurred. Generally, extramural speech refers to public speech as a citizen. And when I say citizen here, it doesn't mean immigration status. It means one living in the society so that whether you are um, a, a faculty member who does research and teaching or, or teaching or both of those, you still 
as a faculty member, hold on to those rights as a citizen to engage in public speech, extramural speech. More about that in a moment. But those were the individual rights. There were also uh, principles in the founding documents of individual rights of tenure, which provide a strong form of job security for faculty and to enforce those rights of job security and academic freedom. Along with that come individual due process rights, which puts the burden of proof on the administration to prove that there is good cause for discipline or discharge. Again, more about that in a moment. In addition to these individual rights, the founding documents identify collective rights, shared governance. Shared governance is a collective right of faculty to make decisions about a whole range of issues that are of interest to the faculty and that address issues of educational policy and educational matters, such as academic program creation, degrees, granting degrees, hiring our colleagues, uh, promotion to tenure, and other kinds of uh, policy and programmatic issues in the university. And part of that collective form of shared governance, and I would call it a collective right of academic freedom, is what we could now term intramural speech. And that is, outside of our teaching and research, we also engage in speech that may be critical of the administration through our faculty governance processes, whether that's in a faculty senate or other kind of faculty governance processes, that sort of intramural speech is also part of our individual and collective academic freedom. Now, I also want to emphasize that the 1915 Declaration of Principles and the 1940 Statement from the AUP um, place these rights in connection to the public mission of the university that it's important for faculty to have these rights of academic freedom in all their forms because the university exists to serve the public interest, not to serve private interests. It's important inherently and intrinsically for us as people who are doing this work to have these rights, but it's also instrumentally connected to the public mission of the university. So this means that faculty must be independent from the university administration from private parties and from governmental institutions that may seek to pressure faculty to follow certain paths in their teaching and research. It also means that academic freedom um, gives faculty independence in their expression through teaching, research, and their shared governance activities, as well as in their extramural speech. Faculty must be protected from pressure to conform to others' interests in regard to their speech and their expression. Whether those pressures come from the university administration, from governmental actors, or from private parties. One interesting aspect of the development of academic freedom is that what I've just described to you could be viewed as what has sometimes been called extra legal rights. That is, these rights are not coming from statutes. They're not coming in their origins from the US Constitution. Certainly, they resonate with rights of free speech under something like the First Amendment. But they are professional norms of academic freedom. They are professional norms that the faculty have claimed for themselves and that were developed outside of the legal system through the organizational founding and the growth of the AAUP and through the adoption of AAUP principles and standards throughout the profession. These professional norms have a great deal of power. They have been strong and they have been lasting. The 1940 Statement of Principles has been endorsed by more than 250 disciplinary societies and higher education associations. Many colleges and universities, including this one, include AUP principles and standards in their faculty handbooks and in university policies. And so in some ways, these professional norms have their power from this extra legal development. And in some ways, substantively, these professional norms are broader 
and stronger than constitutional First Amendment rights of free speech that may include academic freedom. And I just want to mention those because I think it's particularly important in a private university to understand where these rights come from and to understand how important it is for us to collectively support these rights, these professional norms. So first, there's the question of who can claim a right of academic freedom? So the professional norms of academic freedom apply to all college and university faculty, whether it's the public sector or the private sector. The professional norms cover everyone. In contrast, First Amendment rights of free speech protect faculty only in public universities. And that's true generally for the Bill of Rights, that the Bill of Rights to the US Constitution protects individuals and groups from governmental power or governmental action. And so as a, a private university faculty member, you do not have First Amendment rights vis-a-vis -vis the university administration. So that's an important thing to realize. Now, there's also the question of, well, what is the scope and strength of the right of academic freedom? The US Supreme Court has recognized that academic freedom is, as they say, a special concern of the First Amendment. And certainly, if you're in a public university, you can claim a right of academic freedom under the US Constitution as part of your rights of free speech. However, the US Supreme Court in other public employment cases dealing with the First Amendment, the US Supreme Court has limited the scope and strength of First Amendment rights for public employees. And that has also constrained in certain areas First Amendment rights for public sector uh, university faculty. In contrast, the professional norms of academic freedom include a broad scope of individual faculty academic freedom that cover, as I said, teaching, research, and extramural speech, and that include these professional norms for shared governance as a collective faculty right of academic freedom. That's broader than the First Amendment. And so where professional norms of academic freedom are adopted in university policies, they can become very strong norms and may even be legally enforceable as contract rights. Now this then leads to the importance of recognizing areas where these professional norms of academic freedom have come under attack. And some of them are more recent, but these attacks are, are longer than just our sort of last few years. So one problem is that the norms that one finds and the policies in university faculty handbooks have not always been found to be enforceable as contracts in the courts. So if we'd like them to be as enforceable as possible, it's very important to write those policies in ways that uh, bind all parties to implementing and to enforcing policies of academic freedom and foreshadowing where I'm going to go, that tells you something about why shared governance is so important. Right? If we'd really like to have our individual rights protected and enforced, we need to do it collectively. That's not a new idea. It's always been true. If we think about social movements, from the earliest social movements in this country on, they have always come from the bottom up the laws that have been passed, the um, concessions that have been made by people in power, those are always made through demands by, through collective social movements. And so that's true here as well. They come from our collective strength. And that would then translate into those kinds of issues of enforceability of academic freedom as a contract right in courts. There's also been since at least the early to mid-1980s, the continuing changing nature of the profession itself. The changes in the academic profession have made it very difficult for faculty to engage in meaningful academic freedom. And this is where that concept of the corporatization of the university comes in. So there's the really shocking levels of loss of tenure track and tenured lines for faculty, where 
about 70% of faculty lines in the US now are non-tenure track lines. And that is a reversal from around the late 60s, if you look at the 70-30 split. So we've gone from the large majority of faculty lines being ones with tenure track and tenured uh, positions with that strong form of job security to being mostly a contingent or precarious workforce. And of course, that's going to differ depending on which university you are. It may differ depending on which department. But the insecurity in the uh, academic profession has just grown and grown, and it seems to be on this continual trend. And so non-tenure track faculty, contingent faculty, face continued economic and professional insecurity that makes it very difficult to, meaningful, to meaningfully and fully exercise academic freedom. There's been a corresponding loss and weakening of shared governance that comes along with the growing precarity of the academic profession. Um, and this makes it extremely difficult to have the kind of collective power that's needed through shared governance to ensure that universities have a strong internal institutional commitment and enforcement to uh, professional norms of academic freedom. So as we've become a more precarious workforce, it's weakened our ability in many instances to have strong shared governance because of that precarity. And most recently, we have seen the current political climate that has led to more attacks on faculty speech and academic freedom. And that's where I'd like to turn now to those more recent attacks. We could put those attacks under the general rubric of censorship. And there are different kinds of censorship that have occurred. Some of those have been censorship that have that um, comes from the university administration censoring faculty by imposing punitive measures on faculty, either because the administration may disapprove of faculty speech or because the administration is responding to pressure from parties or institutions outside the university to censor or punish faculty members because of their speech. The other censoring mechanism is also coming from these corporatization issues where part of corporatization has involved more of a kind of a risk management approach by the university as an institution. More of a fear of being sued, uh, a fear of poor public relations that may come out of acting like a university and having heated debate and controversial issues. And with that kind of corporate mentality, it moves away from the focus on principles of academic freedom. So I'm going to, as you can anticipate, refer to what happened at University of Tampa. And I'm sure that everybody in this audience knows more details about this than I do, but I'm going to just address some of the points that come from my own reading um, of, of this issue. In August 2017, here at University of Tampa, the university discharged Dr. Kenneth Story, who was a visiting assistant professor of sociology, because of a tweet in which he suggested that Hurricane Harvey was, quote, karma for Texas because it had voted Republican. Now, the AAUP wrote a letter to the University of Tampa administration expressing concerns about the university's failure to protect Dr. Story's academic freedom and his due process rights. And so we're gonna get into that link between academic freedom and due process. So some of the key points here about these, these issues uh, that were raised in the AUP's letter was first, that the reason for dismissal in this case raises a very serious issue of academic freedom. As the letter uh, explained, Faculty members have the right to speak and write as citizens free from institutional censorship or discipline, that issue of extramural speech. And the letter pointed out that this is a policy that exists in, in writing at the University of Tampa itself. 
The AUP letter also raised the point that the administration dismissed Dr. Story without, ha without having first demonstrated cause, adequate cause, in a faculty hearing, and that this lack of a hearing was at, is, at fundament, is fundamentally at odds with basic standards of, as we call it, academic due process. So what does that mean? Academic due process comes from AUP standards that state that if an administration seeks to discharge or impose other serious discipline on faculty members, that the university administration must follow basic standards of due process. This includes notice of charges, as well as a hearing before faculty peers. So shared governance includes faculty peer determinations about um, uh, discipline and whether the administration has carried its burden of proving cause for discharge. This faculty hearing would result in a recommendation to the administration. And the expectation is that the administration will follow that recommendation or provide the faculty hearing panel with its reasons for not following the faculty recommendation. And key to proving adequate cause is that the administration must prove by clear and convincing evidence that alleged misconduct occurred and that the administration must show that the conduct that it proves demonstrates that the faculty member is unfit to serve as a faculty member. Now, in the case of Dr. Story, the AUP standards protect academic freedom and extramural speech and set forth the due process requirements that should have been followed. And now what I'm going to read to you is the language from the AUP statement from 1964 on extramural speech, which has been incorporated into the 1940 statement of principles, and which you can find in your faculty handbook here at University of Tampa. And that is with regard to extramural speech, and now I'm quoting, the controlling principle is that a faculty member's expression of opinion as a citizen cannot constitute grounds for dismissal unless it clearly demonstrates the faculty member's unfitness to serve. Extramural utterances rarely bear upon the, upon the faculty member's fitness for continuing service. Moreover, a final decision should take into account the faculty member's entire record as a teacher and scholar. And the AUP letter to the president of the University of Tampa noted that the faculty handbook here at the University of Tampa explicitly endorses the 1940 statement and contains this statement that I just read to you about extramural utterances. The AUP urged the administration to rescind the notice of dismissal that had been issued to Professor Story and to rescind that immediately and to ensure that any future actions are consistent with the standards that we, I just referenced here. Of course, as you know, the outcome of the case was that uh, Dr. Story resigned and that the university rescinded the dismissal. Um, it's good that the university rescinded the dismissal, but unfortunately we have an individual faculty member who was not able to continue in his position. So now I want to give you some other recent examples that show this serious problem of disciplinary action that has been taken against faculty for their extramural speech. And of course, as you all know, a lot of that has come from extramural speech on social media whether it's Twitter or some other form of social media. And what we see here when we look at the cases is a pattern of punitive actions by universities against faculty for their speech that deals with issues of racial inequalities. It's inescapable that the commentary, the analysis, and the strong speech that's highly critical of racism at a systemic level is that this theme runs through many of the punitive actions that have been taken against faculty for their extramural speech. This speech has been viewed as uh, controversial, I think because it goes to those sort of systemic issues, but often, as one expects to see in social media, the speech itself is quite deliberately 
grabbing people's attention. It's oftentimes satirical or ironic in its commentary, and it grabs people atten people's attention and it places it on these systemic issues of inequality that include issues of racism and sexism and, and other forms of systemic inequality in the United States. Now also, this extramural speech, which is done, of course, in public, oftentimes on Twitter and other forms of social media, means that it's going to be subject to very wide and quick dissemination. And the technological changes that have enabled the speech to be disseminated so quickly and so widely has often drawn targeted harassment from the public, including, again, this is uh, an inescapable theme, here, including vicious threats of violence. Now, any threat of violence is, is obviously a problem, but the kind of viciousness of these threats, including uh, you know, threats that people should be lynched and you know, other forms of, of just really um, frightening, really terrifying speech that engage in you know, racist uh, threats of violence, homophobia, um, terrible hostility towards women in various forms and the way those inter, interweave has, has really been shocking. Um, and this kind of targeted harassment also has been accompanied in many cases by pressure from outside parties for the university to discharge or discipline the faculty member. Um, so in addition to the incident that occurred here, there are some other very well-publicized cases. I'm just going to mention a few rather than go through a very long list. But one of the well-known cases was Professor George Ciccariello Mayer, who is a, an associate, he was an associate professor at Drexel University. Um, and he uh, made some statements that dealt with issues of racism in ways that were considered extremely controversial and inflammatory and because of that he was placed on a uni un he was placed unilaterally by the administration on a paid leave um, and oftentimes with those kinds of suspensions or leaves administrators will say we're doing this because of problems of safety and so the expressed concerns about safety can translate into uh, actions being taken against the person whose safety we should be concerned about. Um, in this case, um, there was again a, a quite a large public outcry, not only against the professor, but also Fortunately, in these cases, there's a public outcry in defense of the professor. AAUP wrote a letter to Drexel University. There were other colleagues who came to um, uh, the academic um, colleagues' defense. But unfortunately, what happened here was that Professor Chicariello Mayer uh, resigned his position because of the kinds of threats of violence that were continuing to be uh, brought against him from the public. Another well-known and well-publicized case was a professor, Johnny Eric Williams, at Trinity College. Again, he was placed on a unilateral leave. Oh, actually, I, I misspoke in um, the Drexel case. This was a unilateral suspension. In uh, the Trinity case, case, it was a unilateral paid leave. Again, the AUP stepped in with a letter to the university. Um, and in that case, uh, Trinity College uh, investigated itself after the outcry with regard to the suspension of the faculty member who again had, dress, uh, had addressed issues of race and racism. And the university changed its position and uh, recognized that Professor Williams had academic freedom which should have been recognized. So we can see that collective responses, again, were very important to protect the faculty member. Um, there was an adjunct faculty member, Lisa Durden, who was a faculty member in communication at Essex College in New Jersey. And um, she was suspended and then fired because of statements that she made, again, about issues dealing with race uh, in the public media. 
So I'm not going to go on with, I have other examples if you would like them, but we see again and again uh, when issues of race are at the center of the critiques that faculty make, that accompanying that comes a public outcry because people don't like the things that are said. And some of these statements are, one could say, incendiary. They are controversial, but that's the nature of free speech. Uh, one of the uh, statements by Justice Holmes from the Supreme Court that I like very well in a, free, a famous free speech case was that he said that every idea is an incitement. I just love that line. It captures so much about why we protect speech. We don't protect speech because everybody accepts it and feels just fine about it. We protect speech, that, that speech doesn't need protection, it already has it. We protect speech because it can engender these kinds of strong responses, because it can incite people to uh, talk with each other. It may even incite people to take action, but that's not the problem with the speech. You know, the action that people take uh, we, we hold people responsible for their action, but the notion of incitement is at the heart of what we do in academic freedom, is to get people excited and incited about the kinds of things they hear. Now, there, there have been um, at least some other examples that have come out. I just want to briefly um, cite one from Syracuse University, where the university administration came forward strongly in protecting a faculty member who had made statements that outsiders felt were um, um, crossed a line and being too controversial. And in that case, the uh, chancellor of Syracuse University, Kent Siverud, stated that he would not denounce or dismiss the professor for her tweet. He said, we are and will remain a university. Free speech is and will remain one of our key values. I can't imagine academic freedom or the genuine search for truth thriving here without free speech. Our faculty must be able to say and write things, including things that provoke some or make others uncomfortable up to the very limits of the law. Uh, so that's an example of what we should expect from our administrators. And I would just add here that in addition to some of the punitive measures that have been taken by administrators, another problem has been a pattern of some administrations and universities saying, well, we recognize academic freedom, but we find the speech by this faculty member to be reprehensible or to be something we don't believe in. And so it's a very tepid or lukewarm statement in support of academic freedom. All right, so what are the harms that come from violations of academic freedom and due process that has occurred in these examples and in, in other examples? Well, first, of course, the individual faculty member whose individual rights were violated, that person is harmed. There's harm to that person's career. There's harm because they've been threatened. Um, in, in many cases, and there's a huge impact on their personal and economic conditions. But there's also the chilling effect that occurs. It instills fear in other faculty and can encourage faculty to engage in self-censorship from the kinds of situations where they see faculty under attack and perhaps not supported by their administration and even punished by their administration. And this kind of chilling effect emboldens right-wing harassment of faculty, including these threats of violence. This flows from the university's failure to defend faculty academic freedom, from universities who fail to condemn targeted harassment and threats against faculty. You know, this doesn't mean that we are compromising on free speech. Free speech can be quite vociferous when people object to what a faculty member has said. We all recognize that. But when it crosses the line into threats of violence against faculty members, this is where we expect our colleagues and our administrators to step up and defend against these kinds of right-wing attacks. Um, Professor Chicariello Mayer wrote about this he said, by bowing to pressure from racist internet trolls 
Drexel has sent the wrong signal that you can control a university's curriculum with anonymous threats of violence. So now, what do these examples reveal about the necessary conditions for meaningful exercise of academic freedom? And I have a list here, and I just want to go down them, because I think we need to learn from this and to say, what do we want to do to make sure that the conditions on the ground enforce and encourage academic freedom? So number one, we have to have a strong commitment to academic freedom by our universities, by our university administrations, and from faculty including adopting policies with AUP standards defining academic freedom broadly and deeply in the ways we just talked about it, teaching research and extramural speech as well as speech and shared governance. And this faculty commitment is as important as the administration's commitment. We have to be willing to step forward about that. We also need university and faculty commitment to requiring procedural due process to any faculty member alleged to have engaged in misconduct. And this brings in that essential link between academic freedom in speech and expression and academic due process. The procedures themselves support and enforce those substantive aspects of academic freedom that are so important. Having due process protections deters administrators from even bringing charges, which could be intimidating in and of themselves, just the charges. Because the nature of the due process is that no disciplinary standards, or excuse me, no discipline should be brought without a strong basis in evidence that there's faculty incompetence and unfitness to serve. That is, that can be proved. And at the hearing, as I said earlier, the burden of proof is on the administration to show unfitness to serve through clear and convincing evidence. The controversial nature of speech in any of its aspects of teaching research and extramural speech or, or governance is never a valid reason and never a valid basis for disciplinary charges or disciplinary action. And once again, it's the controversy, it's the heated debate, it's the offensiveness that may occur through speech that are central to academic freedom and to the universities being able to function as a university. In a, a case in 1957 uh, from the Supreme Court, court called Sweezy versus New Hampshire, the court said the, essence, the essentiality of academic freedom in the community of American universities is almost self-evident. In the Kiyishian case in 1967, Kiyishian versus Board of Regents, the Supreme Court said, our nation is deeply committed to safeguarding academic freedom, which is of transcendent value to all of us and not merely to the teachers concerned. So now I wanna emphasize the link between not only academic freedom and due process, but the links among academic freedom, due process, and shared governance. We must have strong shared governance because this creates pressure on the university administration to protect academic freedom of faculty. We must have collective governance in order to create university policies and to adopt university policies that protect both academic freedom and due process. This holds the university administration to not only creating and adopting those standards, but following those standards. Because as a collective, we will protest, we must protest if the university does not follow those standards. Now I know we have at least one administrator in the room and possibly more. And so when I talk about pressuring the administration, um, I hope you're good with that. I mean, the nature of being an administrator, right, is that you gotta take the heat. And that's the nature of collective protest, that when you're in a position of power in the administration, you should expect collective protest from the faculty and from students when they think that you're not doing something that, um, that you should do, and certainly here when it affects their rights. So of course, the way to, to avoid that conflict is to sit down and negotiate. 
and reach agreements. Um, and, and what's essential is that as a collective, that we protect our colleagues, that we reinforce our shared commitment to protecting our mutual rights to academic freedom. And this means that we have to protect all faculty's rights. Now we get to back to the changing nature of the profession. Without job security, faculty may not feel they can speak out as much as they would like to, whether through teaching, research, governance, or extramural speech. We have to protect those faculty, hopefully by making them tenure track and tenured faculty, but there may be other ways to protect them, certainly through due process in addition to job security. And we have to encourage and protect our faculty colleagues who are on the tenure track line before they get tenure. I always spoke out. I think it's partly because I enjoy it so much, but it's a muscle. We have to exercise it. We lose that muscle if we don't exercise it. And without this meaningful academic freedom, job security, strong shared governance, due process, we will have self-censorship. People will be, and in fact are, oftentimes afraid to speak out. And in doing that, in not speaking out, in censoring ourselves, no matter what status we have as a faculty member, we simply accomplish the goals of others who wish to silence us. And I've certainly seen more and more fear over the years I've been a faculty member in the university to speak out. It's our job as faculty to speak out. It's not just oh, well, I'll do it if I want. It's our job. It's our obligation to speak out and to defend others for their rights to speak out. And I want to end with um, a long quotation, but it's written by somebody who really knows how to write. And it's a quotation from Michael Wilson. If any of you are movie fans, and if any of you are interested in the McCarthy era, as I am, you'll know about Michael Wilson. He was um, blacklisted during the McCarthy era because of his politics, and he was one of the blacklisted writers in Hollywood. He's very famous because he was a screenwriter of The Bridge on the River Kwai, which he was not given credit for. He got it, the credit posthumously. That was during the front uh, in the McCarthy era. They didn't give him credit for actually writing it. He wrote Salt of the Earth, which was made by blacklisted writers, actors, um, producers, and, um, and directors. And if you haven't seen it, I certainly recommend it. It was made in 1953. And Michael Wilson, in 1976, after the blacklist was over, gave a speech to the Writers Guild of America. And I believe that his analysis of freedom of speech applies to our current discussion of academic freedom in the university. He was talking about Hollywood and the Writers Guild, um, the, the union of writers. But I think it applies to what we're talking about here for academic freedom. He describes our moral obligation to protect our colleagues' right to speak freely and with reta without retaliation. So I'm just going to read it to you here. He says, I don't want to dwell on the past, but for a few moments to speak of the future. And I address my remarks particularly to you younger men and women who had perhaps not established yourself in this industry at the time of the great witch hunt. I feel that unless you remember this dark epic and understand it, you may be doomed to replay it. Not with the same cast of characters, of course, or on the same issues, but I see a day perhaps coming in your lifetime, if not in mine, when a new crisis of belief will grip this republic when diversity of opinion will be labeled disloyalty, and when extraordinary pressures will be put on writers and the mass media to conform to administration policy on the key issues of the time, whatever they may be. If this gloomy scenario should come to pass, I trust that you younger men and women will shelter the mavericks and dissenters in your ranks and protect their right to work. The Writers Guild will have the use and need of rebels if it is to survive as a union of free writers. This nation will have the need of them if it is to survive as an open society. 
And so Michael Wilson captures the essential link between the individual freedom of speech and the collective power to protect that speech. And these are the same ideas that are so compelling in our current time in higher education. And so through shared governance, whether it's a faculty senate, through faculty committees, or through faculty unions, or both, it is our obligation and our honor to protect all our colleagues, including, and especially, as Michael Wilson said, the mavericks and the dissenters in our ranks. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Okay, we now have some time for questions. Hello, and thank you for being here. Um, I was, was concerned that uh, Charlie Kirk of Turning Point USA, which uh, sponsors the Professor Watch List, was involved in getting Kevin Story fired from the University of Tampa. Um, are you aware of any uh, work being done by Turning Point USA to limit academic freedom at American colleges and universities? Am I aware of work that they're doing? Yes, Charlie yeah, well, Kirk. They're, yeah, they're, um, I'm certainly, as you said, the watch list, you know, is an attack. And um, I, don't, I don't have any other specific things to add, but I mean, it stands to reason if you look at that Professor watched us that a whole lot of things are being done. And you know, the good news about some of this is that we can find a lot of information just by you know, uh, doing research on it. But these kinds of organized right-wing groups have different names. Turning Point is one of them. But we see it you know, in different forms in different places. Um, and so I'm sure there's coordination that's being, that must be done among, among various groups. Well, early on, um, Charlie Kirk tweeted about uh, Professor Story's tweet mm -hmm. that had to do with uh, Hurricane Harvey. And it was picked up by townhall.com, which is the uh, largest subscribed to right-wing website on the internet. And they, run an, they ran an article against Kevin Story and the University of Tampa. And I know I wasn't at the, I know that uh, our provost, Dr. Stern, went to the Senate and explained how inundated the administration was with emails and phone calls. And uh, I wasn't at the Senate meeting, but I did listen to the audio tape. And I was concerned that this was an orchestrated effort um, to um, harass the University of Tampa and to the point where they fired Kevin Story, and they did. I know they, that they rescinded it. But uh, uh, the outcome was Kevin Story is gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, Turning Point USA, Professor Watchlist, uh, Charlie Kirk, uh, townhall.com, they succeeded. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, our administration, gave them a hand uh, for their success. I think enabled them to succeed. That's well, these clearly are orchestrated you know, actions. Um, and, and something I've been thinking about a lot that applies here, but also applies elsewhere, in other forms of higher, in other you know institutions of higher education, but also more broadly, is how much we're on the defensive now. And I say we, meaning those of us who believe in things like uh, higher education, like public goods to people, uh, whether it's insurance or um, healthcare generally, or people having enough to eat, you know, all all these kinds of basic needs including free speech and expression and the role of universities in, in the United States, and also labor rights more generally. Because to me, collective action, collective organizing is collective organizing. Whether it's in the form of a union, whether it's in the form of a Senate, collective action is collective action. And some of it's stronger, and some of it's less strong. And we've been so much on the defensive that I think what we also have to do is to say, how do we join together to be on the offense? 
And I think one of the ways to be on the offense to say, you know, there's a whole lot coming at us and, and all we're doing is battling this and this and this and this kind of attack on basic rights and basic principles of living in a democracy, I think is to say, how do we turn it around and take an offensive position? And I think that university administrations can be part of that. And that's why I quoted uh, the, the lines from the statements from the chancellor at Syracuse University. That was a principled stance. It took some courage, but it was essential because we lose if we don't do that. We just simply lose, and we lose our heart if we are always on the defensive and always afraid about orchestrated attacks. It's just like, back off, you know, back off. Our faculty can say what they want, and if it crosses a line into something that is actual misconduct that reflects on their competence, we can take care of it. But I think that the right wing attacks know that many universities run scared. And so we need to stop doing their work for them and to see an alliance between the administration and the faculty and the students. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, social media is just such a new form of communication. I, I guess I'm just curious, or maybe you could expand a little more on what you see as unique challenges inherent in social media as far as extramural communication, to use one of your words, and maybe what does productive conversation early look like between administration or, or university and faculty or or what does that kind of look like to, mm -hmm. to be productive? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think you raised two very important questions within that question, I think they're related. Yeah, I mean, social media is, it is such a, a powerful tool to get ideas out, but it's not a particularly nuanced tool in many instances. Uh, that's the nature of, of, the, of, of social media. But it does, it does really drive discussions in many instances. So I think that for one thing, we, we should recognize that it is powerful, that people have lots of choices in how they use social media, and that it's individuals' choices about how they want to use social media, not whether I think it's a good idea or whether the administration thinks it's a good idea to use social media in a certain way. These are the choices people have when they engage in speech. And even if you say, well, couldn't you have said that a different way? Well, maybe the answer is yes, but I chose not to say it in that way. This is how I chose to say it. Um, and I think we need to respect that. Now, that's where also extramural speech comes in, I think, in a really important way. Because when individuals use social media, let's say a faculty member uses Twitter, or other forms of social media, they may be speaking about issues that they work on in their own research or teaching, or they may be speaking on issues that are outside their disciplines completely. But in either case, the use of social media fits into extramural speech, that is public speech as a citizen, as opposed to I'm now speaking the way I would in a published article. And one example of that that you, you probably know about is Stephen Salida, who was offered and accepted a position at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And he was, he had uh, resigned from his tenured position, I think it was Virginia Tech, and was in the process of moving to Urbana-Champaign. He had his teaching schedule already, he was all ready to teach, and then there was a public outcry because he had tweeted about um, Palestinian rights and had condemned Israel for its attack on Gaza. And because there was a lot of public pressure from um, uh, different sources, the university administration, the board there, the Board of Regents, um, rescinded the offer. They said, oh, well, he isn't really an employee because we haven't yet decided 
it was a rubber stamp that the board would use to say, well, you get the job, you know, after you've been offered the job and you've already moved there. Oftentimes that was where the rubber stamp came from the administration. But they said, oh, we haven't yet approved this, so we're not approving your coming. Well, uh, Salida sued, but also the AUP got involved in it and investigated at the university and censured uh, University of Illinois for its actions in discharging uh, Salida because of his speech, and they hadn't given due process, they hadn't engaged in governance. You know. So in that case, this was an issue where he was writing, he was tweeting about something that he worked on in his own discipline. However, the AUP emphasized that this was still extramural speech. We shouldn't expect that Twitter or other forms of social media is where you are held to the same kind of disciplinary competence issues as we do when we're promoting somebody or peer re doing peer review of an article for publication. It's a different form of speech, and I think we have to recognize its breath. And that's why the statement on extramural utterances from the AUP that you have in your handbook here emphasizes that it is up to the administration if it brings charges against a faculty member to show by clear and convincing evidence that the extramural speech demonstrates the unfitness to serve, the incompetence of the individual faculty member, which as the statement says is, is extremely rare. Now then it gets to the second part of your question, which is, well, what do you do about it? Well, the time to make those policies to adopt the policies, to recommit to the policies on academic freedom, including extramural speech, due process, is when you're not in a crisis, right? <laughs> um, and so you've had a crisis here. You're beyond that crisis, whether people are satisfied with what happened or not, you're not in that particular crisis. This is the moment to sit down and say, we can expect that something like this will happen again. How do we want to deal with it? How do we, that is the administration, negotiating with the faculty governance bodies, how do we, what kind of protocols do we want to put into place when something like this happens? How do we make sure that the university doesn't make unilateral decisions about how to respond? To make sure that the faculty governance is not only that we write these policies and we know they're in place, but that the faculty governance exist during what could be a crisis, rather than us learning about it after it's over and saying you need to undo something. This is something where it's not just because I think faculty governance is important, you know, by itself, I think it is, but it's a democratic process that can lead to better decisions. And I know, having been involved in faculty governance for a very long time, that um, administrators have said, well, it takes too long. You know, it's slow having faculty governance involved. And we feel that we can't act efficiently. Well, democracy actually does take a while. But in times of crisis, we can also have protocols for how to act quickly in a way that doesn't simply put unilateral power into the administration. And given the kind of publicity that occurred around the incident that happened here, I don't think that was a particularly efficient or quick way or satisfactory way to deal with it. I read the, um, the editorial in the Tampa Bay Times, which excoriated the administration. Uh, so I don't think that was particularly good for public relations or for efficient or fair decision making. So in fact, doing the work ahead of time to put these protocols into effect will be more likely to lead to better decision making. Hi, I'm Christopher Bolt. I'm a professor of communication. Um, I just want to thank you for coming here. Uh, I really loved your remarks. I wanted to respond to your acknowledgement of the chilling effect. I'd actually written down that note even before you said it. Um, I, for one, experienced it on two levels that I'd like you to maybe address or comment on. Um, the first one was professional. I had to explain to colleagues at other universities um, what happened here, and I was frankly embarrassed. Um, so I felt there was a, lo a loss of standing mm -hmm. for the school that remains um, at professional conferences I go to. The second piece is a chilling effect I felt in the classroom. Now, you addressed 
intramural versus extramural speech. And I did find it outrageous that a, a tweet that seems to be in an extramur extramural um, situation is a right of citizenship. Mm -hmm. I would hate to think that someone would go through my social media feeds to try to take something out of context and then shame the university into firing me for it. I'd hate mm -hmm. to think that would happen. But that's the extramural. I felt chilled mm -hmm. in the intramural, mm -hmm. thinking if a student, maybe even an agent of this activist organization that's trying to pressure universities to dispense with controversial or social justice oriented faculty, just brings an iPhone in and audio records a lecture I give, they could probably pick a little statement, put it up, circulate it, and I'd be in the same situation. Mm -hmm. Could you describe your response yeah. to that? Yeah, yeah, thanks so much. So let me take the first piece. Uh, I think it's really important in terms of the uh, damage that occurs in these kinds of situations in terms of the standing of the university, the reputation. At University of Illinois, there were boycotts against uh, University of Illinois with the Stephen Salida case where conferences were co canceled. And the university in that case couldn't wait to get off the censure list from the AUP. So it, it, the, the impact of organized protest against the university was very important. Now, unfortunately, Professor Salida is not a professor at University of Illinois. So a lot of these cases end with the individual being really sacrificed in many instances. He did sue the university, but he also settled. You know, these are very emotionally stressful and expensive things for people to do to sue. You know, so there's, there's the damage to the individ individual, to the faculty, and, and here, as you said, to the standing of the university. I think it should be embarrassing when something like this happens. Because if you want to attract people to come to university, this is not what everybody should know about, right? That, that you didn't stand up for your faculty. And then your second point, I think, is also important. I'm so glad you raised it. Because of the interrelationship among things we think of as three different categories, and what you're pointing out is they're not separate categories, that self-censorship and fear in the classroom is related to what's happening with extramural speech and our fears with regard to research um, and what we say in our research may be related to these issues of classroom speech as well as extramural speech. Our fears about job security may then also act as a self-censoring mechanism in all of these. And I've actually really been surprised at how tenured faculty do not step up. And, and say something about what's happening uh, when we have violations of academic freedom or governance. You know, and again, like I said, it's that muscle. And the idea that, well, once I get tenure, then I'll speak out is very rare. You know, Kurt Vonnegut said, I think it was in the novel Mother Night, he said, beware of who you pretend to be because you may end up being that person. You know, you've got to exercise that muscle. So, this notion of self-censorship and fear, I think, is the biggest problem. I think it's the biggest problem. I know I censor myself all the time. Now, I don't censor myself as much as other people, but you know, if, if people say, oh, well, you know, you're so biased for labor and blah, 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 you know, in my classrooms, I think you should hear all the things I don't say, you know? Um, because we're, we're, all, we're all engaged in that because I think we're so much under the microscope, right? Um, and I think it's a huge problem and our students are being hurt by it. We're being hurt by it. The universities are being hurt by it. This is really damaging. And that's where I think the collective comes in that those lines of Michael Wilson of sheltering the mavericks and the dissenters under our wings is essential. It must be done collectively. Um, and you know, I don't know how else to do it because it's so important that we know that our faculty colleagues have our backs and that those who are in disagreement with us on our substantive views also have our backs. You know, I've done much, I've done better and sort of more, had more successful relationships with people who I consider simply honest conservatives than I have sometimes who are, you know, with people who are perhaps liberal but not willing to speak out. 
So we really have to have each other's backs to do this. And, and I think, again, this is where governance comes in. I don't know if I've, I mean, I can't give the answer to your question other than to say I think it's real. And, and I think we should acknowledge it and then act again back in that offensive to say that we, we believe in these issues. Hi. I really appreciate your level of perspective on this. And I have two questions. Uh, one's very brief and one probably not. So um, a lot of people put on Twitter, for example, tweets are my own or not affiliated. Could you speak to the effectiveness of that uh, if, or if anything like that um, tends to work? My, I imagine that it's hard to find cases where that's the case. And my second question is, um, for staff as an unprotected and often overlooked um, class, if you will, what role would you, would you mind speaking toward the role of staff in this process? You mean staff broadly defined or? Yeah, well, know? academic staff, uh, staff, uh, you know, for, for example, um, I've, you know, I've got a PhD, I do research, I teach, I'm interested, but I'm staff. So although I may, may be qualified along the same lines and some of the same interest levels, what I do is not tied to a faculty line. So for, that's my mm -hmm. personal interest, but there are other corollary uh, staff members all over, instructional staff, uh, you mm -hmm. know, other mm -hmm. areas mm -hmm. like that who may mm -hmm. have an interest in supporting this but may not have an active role. Okay, great, thanks, yeah. Uh, so on the first question, yeah, these sort of disclaimers, I'm speaking for myself. You know, my own personal view of that is I don't, I, I don't think we should have to have disclaimers. When somebody writes a tweet and their professor, let's say, or faculty member at a university, I don't think anybody in the world thinks that that professor is tweeting on behalf of the university administration. <laughs> I just don't think so. Um, and so I'm very wary of imposing requirements on people to say this is my own speech and not the university's. And I've seen the university say all kinds of things on behalf of the university administration and they never disclaim that they're, you know, they never say, well, we're not speaking for all the faculty members because sometimes they put out you know, positions that I completely disagree with, right? But I know that you know, they're speaking for the institution and not specifically for me. But I think it's even stronger that people understand if a faculty member says something that they're not speaking for the, the university. So you know, I don't put a lot of stock in them. And plus, I think that it's a way of, again, silencing people. Because there are all kinds of spaces where you speak out. And it would be so artificial to say, now I'm saying this for myself and not for others. You know, it's, it's an artificial kind of an obstacle. So that's, that's my own view on it. But in terms of staff, I think you're, you're raising some very important questions. And, and I think it links to that issue of, you know, non-tenure track faculty as well, is how to organize, right? How to get protection. So as I said in my talk, you know, I think that all faculty who have greater power, like tenured faculty, should work to protect everybody who has a faculty position, no matter what the title. And I would extend that to academic uh, professionals as well. The AUP uh, includes all academic professionals as well as people on tenure track lines, people on non-tenure track lines. So I know you have an AUP chapter on campus, and I would encourage people to become part of the AUP chapter on campus, as well as being involved in governance. And again, that's that collective action to say, well, individually, we don't have the same kind of power we have collectively. And I would also say that uh, unions are something for people to consider. Now, for tenure track and tenured faculty to unionize in a private university ha has some obstacles in terms of rights to unionize because the um, Supreme Court in 1980 in the Yeshiva University case basically defined tenure and tenure track faculty uh, in, in private universities. Most of them would be in so-called managerial positions without rights to unionize under the National Labor Relations Act. Now, but we organize all the time. We have shared governance. We have academic freedom. So we're the most protected, even without a union, to be able to organize. In the public sector, faculty are organized at many campuses because they're working under public sector laws. 
but for um, non-tenure track faculty, for staff. I know, I'm, I know I'm in Florida, I do know that. I grew up here, so I, I know something about uh, views about labor unions in, in the South and elsewhere. Um, but for staff and for non-tenure track faculty, unionization is something that is not only collective, but it has power because if people unionize under the law, this obligates the employer to collectively bargain with them. Now, of course, I'm sure you know that in public sector universities in Florida, that they've been unionized, the faculty has been unionized for many, many years. And so I think that that is one way people get protection, is by organizing in different ways. And unions are one of those ways to organize that I think can be very effective through collective bargaining and having a collective bargaining agreement. Thank you. I, I'd like to go back to the uh, discussion of social media. If I understood you correctly, you, you were associating all uses of social media with extramural utterances. And I'd like to ask you to comment on a, on a particular case, if, if, if you're able to. I'm thinking of the case of, I, I believe his name is Tommy Curry, a professor of philosophy at, at Texas A&M, whose podcast uh, became uh, uh, to use the word that you used, uh, incendiary. And uh, the university tried to distance them, themselves mm -hmm. from those podcasts, treating them as something he was entitled to do, but his private, uh, his private mm -hmm. activity. And his response was, no, you don't. You hired me to do this work. In effect, you hired me to be a public intellectual using social media as one of the tools how does that complicate mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the thinking that we need to do about mm -hmm. social media? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, you know, I'm familiar with the, the case, uh, not in any kind of personal way, I was, I've not been involved with it, but it, it, you know, it is a case where, you know, just in terms of, of kind of filling in some of the, the pieces, though you described it nicely, um, so Professor Curry is at Texas A&M University, and he had this older podcast interview from 2012. Um, and that uh, interview became the focus of a piece in 2017 about him. The piece was called The American Conservative. I guess that's the, um, the magazine. That, that published it. So there was a piece about him, and um, it, it dealt with issues that where they drew from some of the things that he said in the podcast about what does it mean to actually have liberation for black people in the United States. And you know, he talked about uh, issues about whether in liberation struggles that some people may have to die. And so, um, I actually haven't read the pieces myself, and so I can't really talk any more about what he said, but I don't think it really matters because um, it seemed quite clear that his speech fits within protected speech under academic freedom, and I don't think that you're arguing against that. I think you're asking, well, does it matter how we categorize that and how people self-identify in terms of, of what they're doing? So it seems to me that, number one, the university's response was inappropriate whether you categorize uh, Professor Curry's speech as extramural speech, or whether you say, well, it's extramural speech, which kind of overlaps with, um, with his speech as a professor within his discipline. No matter how you categorize it, it's within academic freedom, and I think that the university's response was inappropriate. They said that they found his statements disturbing and reprehensible, and fortunately, colleagues collectively spoke out against the university for their for the university's quote anemic support for curry and the president did issue a second statement dialing it back a little bit by focusing more on issues of academic freedom so it does show that collective action works 
and it can be protective of, of our colleagues. But in terms of your question, I think that sometimes lines can be hard to draw. And sometimes they're not hard to draw. Sometimes, like the, the Salida tweet is easy. You know, it's clearly extramural speech, even though it was about his discipline, right, because of the nature of the, the speech. There might be other instances where you'd say, well, is this only extramural, or is this actually something that's more in the person's kind of disciplinary work, you know, his, the work that we judge him on as a colleague. So I can't really comment on it in this particular case. I haven't looked at it closely enough here. But there may be some instances where we're not completely clear about what it is. Let me go back to that in a second. But the way that I think about it is, do we hold extramural speech to certain kinds of professional standards in the same way that we hold a published article? If I sent my tweets to be published in an academic journal, I don't really expect that they're gonna take that seriously and send it out for peer review, right? Um, so I think we can pretty clearly distinguish between certain types of speech that we say, yeah, this is part of your disciplinary work, this kind of body of work, and work that we say, well, this is just part of your public speech, whether it's public speech on campus, where you're making a speech, let's say at a rally, or in a talk of some kind that isn't really a disciplinary speech, we can oftentimes tell the difference. But sometimes maybe you could argue, no, even though it's less formal, it's still part of your teaching and research in some ways. But that's fine, because it's still protected under academic freedom. It still has um, the, the kind of broad and deep protection that we're calling on for extramural speech. And if there is to be any kind of action taken against a faculty member for the speech he makes in any of these areas, there's still the obligation under due process for the administration if it wants to take action against the person to show by clear and convincing evidence that the person's uh, speech made them incompetent. So I think the standards are the same. And perhaps in some instances, exactly where to draw the line may be difficult. But I think we hold on to those same strong standards. Just to uh, follow up on that, um, I find myself thinking about um, the academic equivalent of uh, walking into a crowded theater and yelling fire. Uh, and falsely, falsely yelling. Falsely, yes. yes, thank you. <laughs> falsely <laughs> yelling fire, right. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm wondering if there's a line that is still you can't cross, you know, does that make somebody incompetent if there's an academic line or if it's, you know, incendiary and causes violence or causes hurt and harm, does that make them incompetent? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and I'm just mm -hmm. curious about your, your mm -hmm, thoughts on that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, I mean, there's two different aspects from what I'm hearing in your question. You know, one is, I think generally, how, what, what is, what, how much proof does it take? How much evidence does it take to show, let's just deal with extramural speech now, to show that extramural speech actually demonstrates a person's unfitness to serve. You know, there isn't a formula for that. We talk about clear and convincing evidence, which means that that's more than a preponderance of evidence. That's the quantum of proof. But how do we know when it actually gets to being that level of incompetence? Not even because it's, and, and it's not because it's incendiary or inflammatory or offensive. That's not the basis on which incompetence in one's job is shown. You know, that's simply tone. Right? People say things that make someone else mad. It could also be content, makes somebody else mad because they really don't like what you have to say. That in and of itself does not show incompetence to continue working. There has to be more to show that you are truly unfit to be a faculty member. And as the extramural statement says, these are rare instances. They should, we should expect that they're rare because the, another uh, phrase that I like from the US Supreme Court about free speech is that it needs breathing space. Right? If we define speech too narrowly, it doesn't have the breathing space where if we're going to draw lines, we need to draw them wide enough 
so that we protect even more speech than perhaps might be protected under certain definitions. So I think that in general that breathing space is, is, very, is very important for certainly the AUP standards. Now, your piece about, you know, your question about speech causing harm, you know, that in and of itself is, is not necessarily true, right? If I say something to a crowd and the crowd says, well, we really agree with what she said, now we're going to go take action. Generally, we hold people responsible for their actions. We don't hold the speaker um, responsible for people being persuaded by the speaker. Under First Amendment law, there, are, there is a line, and I'll just use the First Amendment definition as an example. It's, it's from a case called um, Brandenburg versus Ohio. So again, it's a constitutional question. And um, this was a case where it was a Klan rally, rally and the, um, I forgot which, you know, grand whatever of the, the Klan was up there saying really just horrible anti-Semitic and racist statements. I mean, they were, you know, disgusting. Of course, we know that. But the Supreme Court said that this is not criminal, that the, the speaker for saying horribly racist and anti-Semitic statements could not be criminally prosecuted because the standard of incitement to act unlawfully that could be the basis for prosecuting somebody is that um, the speaker's statements um, may cause imminent unlawful action and that the imminent unlawful action is likely to occur. So both in terms of the nature of the statement, but also the closeness of the statements and unlawful action is what you look at. And so if it's just a generally hateful kind of a thing you're saying, or even if it's not you know, racist, but it's, uh, let's say, you know, most people who, who have been subject to um, state repression have actually been on the left. You know, so if you're talking about, for example, revolution, in the United States being a very positive thing and we should work toward it and you know, call for the overthrow of the government, that same standard applies, that it has to be imminent unlawful action and likely to occur because of the speech. And I think that that expresses, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I think that expresses the same kinds of standards that we're talking about with regard to the relationship with, between extramural speech and a showing of incompetence. There has to be a very, close relationship. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to follow up on that and take it a little bit to an extreme. So what happens in that case that you were just talking about with the grand wizard of whatever he was? He was a grand wizard. That's um, actually in his day job was teaching race and ethnicity at some mm -hmm. university. And the closeness of his professional work in these incendiary remarks, tied to the fact that social media, as I understand it, is a platform that invites hyperbole. Mm -hmm. There are millions and millions of tweets every day and everybody wants to get heard. And the way you get heard is to be even more outlandish than the previous tweet. And how do you evaluate, even if you had that process where you had a faculty committee that were evaluating, you know, these, these kind of tweets that you just know in your gut is not related to what we think of as teaching the truth as you know it, but rather just hyperbole for the purpose of you know, being heard. Yeah, I think you just made an argument for protecting the speech, actually. Um, we all know, as you said, that there's a lot of hyperbole in tweets. We all know that. And as you said, you know, this is this kind of marketplace out there and everybody wants to get heard and followed and retweeted or whatever. Um, the fact that we all know it's hyperbole can also lead us to say, well, I need to take it with a grain of salt. I know it's hyperbole. I'm not going to take 
everything as seriously as I might if it were in an academic article and this person was writing the same thing. Now, if you are tweeting and you happen to have, be, have the most powerful political office in the United States and you say certain things, well, that's a different story because you got some power there, right? You're the commander in chief. And so in that instance, it may not be hyperbole, it may just be scary, you know? That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about your situation where we know that there's a lot of hyperbole, the, the example you gave, in tweets, and we should take them as that. And again, that breathing space. So if somebody says something in a tweet and is then subject to some kind of disciplinary charge, the chilling effect is something that we need to think about. Give things breathing space in order to enable more speech, right? Speech that's made calls for more speech, not for repression of speech. The university administration and faculty are not, um, you know, they're, they're not, they, they don't have to be silent. I criticized Texas A&M for what it said about Professor Curry's speech, and, but I'm not saying that the administration had no, let's say, right or power to say that. I just think they were wrong. So if you put some speech out there, you have to expect that you will get a response to it. And in general, we do. So if I, I actually don't tweet. I don't even know how. Um, <laughs> it's not just generational. I've just sort of not done it, you know. Um, but if I put any statement out here, like today, if I say something, I am taking a risk that somebody will have something to say to me about it and they may say something that I don't like. Now, the AUP has called on universities to condemn targeted harassment of faculty, uh, which has been occurring online, when it does cross that line into threats of violence, you know, the kind of threats we've heard. But at the same time, AUP has made it clear that we understand free speech, and when you put speech out there, you expect a response. And I think the administration should expect that, like I said, it, Texas A&M, I'm, I'm sure that you all had some experience as administrators with regard to the, the situation with Dr. Story where when you put out statements and you take certain positions, you expect a response. So I think that that's a much better approach to say how do we encourage lots of speech including very strong responses to speech you don't like as opposed to let's figure out when we can discipline somebody. Right? It seems to me that's such a rare event that you can have your protocols, as I said, you know, in response to another question in place about if it's truly this crisis, you know, what do we expect to have happen with regard to consultation with faculty and protocols. But most of the cases is just going to be speech you don't like, you know, and, um, the, you know, people can, can make statements about that and get counter statements. Well, if there are no further questions, please join me in once again thanking uh, Professor thank Lieberwitz. Thank you very much. Thanks. And please also join me in thanking the Office of the Provost and the Faculty Senate for bringing Professor Lieberwitz to campus. Thank you very much. Yeah.